So, since we are on time, I want to get uh, and use every minute that I can to help present this lesson that I have for you today. So if you would bow your head with me, a quick word of prayer, we'll get into our lesson, and we'll hopefully get some understanding about what we want to learn here today. The gracious Lord, our Father, Father, our Lord, and Savior, Lord, we are just grateful that, again, you've given us all an opportunity to come into your presence, Lord, where we can sit down, Lord, and sit at your table and hear a word from you, Lord. We thank you for what all what you're doing in our lives, Lord. We pray, Heavenly Father, right now that you would forgive us our sins, Lord, wash us, Lord, make us worthy vessels to be used by you. Lord, we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would open up our hearts and minds and our ears, Lord, that we would hear a word from you, that we would hear what you would have for us to learn today, and Lord, we can use what we've learned to apply to our lives, Lord. We pray for those who are on the way of you, give them safe passage to this place, Lord, and, and we pray, Lord, as we leave this place, we give safe passage back to our resting places as well, Lord. We pray for all the teachers who will teach this day, Lord, send your Holy Spirit, the true teacher, Lord, to teach us your word this day, Lord. Come and, leave and, and be with us this day and, and do we celebrate your word with us today, Lord, is our prayer and, our, and, and what we ask this morning. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we are in uh, the book of Isaiah, and we're going to be in Isaiah for a couple more weeks, and then we'll, trans, we'll go into uh, other parts of the, of the Bible and Hebrews and Revelations in this quarter. So in this quarter, we are uh, in Isaiah, the 25th chapter, and uh, the subject is the mountain of God, Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 10. So, uh, I'm going to give uh, uh, you a kind of insight about who Isaiah is, just like I quoted last week, but I'm going to give it to you differently. Uh, Isaiah is widely regarded as one of the greatest prophets in the Bible. The prophecies God gave him were directed towards Israel, towards Judah, and other nations. He received this vision from God during his reigns of four kings of Judah, which was uh, U U Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And he had a 40-year ministry during the uh, last half of the 8th century, so he, w he, he prophesied about 700 years before Christ. And that's important, as uh, you'll see, I'll kind of focus on that as we move forward. His prophecies are still signs and wonders for us today, because his prophecies were, uh, as you see in this lesson, it's, it's, it has this... Uh, this far-reaching way that he prophesied and what he had to say to us. Uh, 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 Isaiah was, uh, the Jewish tradition said he was killed by being sawed in half by uh, King Manasseh and the son of King Hezekiah. His style of writing reveals that he was well-educated. In fact, they call him the Shakespeare of the Bible because of the way he, he wrote and the, and the way he, kind of, he conveyed his message. Uh, many of the prophecies in Isaiah began uh, for his day, but they moved forward uh, uh, to a fulfillment prior to the return of Christ, and actually after Christ as well. Uh, there's this dualism seen in many of the prophecies of the Bible, and that's part of what you're going to be focused on, this dualism or the pluralism, that when you say something that actually is for that time, and for other times as well. Okay. Uh, there are four themes in the book of Isaiah. Uh, Jesus Christ is the most important theme. As we know, we, we hear all the, uh, Isaiah 53 talks about who Jesus is, and on and on, Isaiah 7, talks about us unto us, the child is born unto us, the son is given, and the nation is given. So we, we know that it has this Jesus theme as a, a dominant theme. Like most of the prophet, prophets of, of God in that period of time, uh, they all were, uh, were God speaking to his people. God had the kings that managed the people, but, but, and, and, they, and he did the, the administration of the people, but God spoke to, through his prophets to speak to the people. And typically the warning that was, turn for your wicked ways, you guys going down the wrong track, there's a, you know, you got, you got hell to pay, you got, you know, that there's a destruction coming. And, uh, and that was the message of most of the prophets, that was also the message of Isaiah. Isaiah also speaks of the day of the Lord, which is a kind of broad term. It also means the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is another, part, another message that is being done. Uh, but that, that, that whole thing of the day of the Lord is a broad period of time. That's the end times, also called the end times. Uh, so Jesus Christ, as it relates to Isaiah, about one-third of the chapter of the book of Isaiah contained the prophecy about Jesus Christ addressing his first 
Uh, and second coming, Isaiah provides more prophecy about the second coming of Christ than these other Old Testament prophets. The following are some of the prophecies that are about Christ in both his first and second comings. Uh, like we know in Isaiah 2, 4, that he shall judge between the nations. Isaiah 4, 2, that he's a branch of the Lord. I, uh, Isaiah 7, like I mentioned before, that unto us a child is born a virgin. He'll be born a virgin, and we'll call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us, right? Uh, that in, in Isaiah 8, 4, he'll be a stumbling stone. And that's what I mentioned last time, that the Jews believed that they, they, they were special and they were important, and that, and that their culture was... Was uh, was was more dominant, and the and the law, and the, and and keeping up with those the Jewish traditions, and and God, be, Jesus became a stumbling stone for them. They 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 couldn't get past the, the, who they were, so he was a stumbling stone. Uh, in Isaiah uh, nine, uh, he's the eternal government we upon his shoulders, and and we will call him the Prince of Peace. And uh, Isaiah eleven two, that the Holy Spirit will rest upon him. And then uh, Isaiah 28, that he would be a tried stone, a precious stone, a pure foundation of the, the church. Uh, the day of the Lord. So the day of the Lord often focuses on the wrath of God, the punishment that will come upon the disobedient uh, for a year before Christ return. This term is used in a broader sense in John. John talks about the day of the Lord in a, in a lot of different facets that's going to happen. It's all about the end times, it's the day of the Lord. And that's... This is more for you guys to get some understanding about as we get into this text, okay? That uh, John says it in, in 10, John 1.10 to describe the events including the wrath of God, the millennium, and the events thereafter occur uh, after Christ's return. Virtually every Old Testament prophet who warned of God's judgment in the day of the Lord also spoke of restored peace and prosperity, like the millennium period, right, that will follow the judgment, okay? Most of this is all background for you, but it helps you to understand uh, where we're going with this text. Uh, uh, the kingdom of God, um, as it relates to the book of Isaiah, again, he, he has these other uh, texts. Uh, I'll, 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 pass, I'll fast forward past these, but these are texts that are, we find in the book of Isaiah that relates to the kingdom of God. That, uh, that again, all these things that, are, again, the government be on the shoulders, that animals will, will live in peace and, and all, okay? But this is how Isaiah uh, progresses with the kingdom of God as one of the subject matters that he talks about in his prophecies and projected about the future events, okay? Uh, like I said, there's this dualism or this pluralism that happens when he, uh, he has his warnings in, uh, about the assurances about Israel and Judah. He talks about the coming of Christ in his prophecies. And then uh, he talks about uh, Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, which we'll get into a lesson. And, uh, and it, there's the same, similar kind of tone that has, that John, uh, the Apostle John has. Uh, John the Revelator, we talk about Revelations. So if someone's taking, you read your Bible, Revelations, chapter 1, verses 1, 2, 9, and 10, it'll help us get into our lesson. So someone read in your Bible, Revelations, chapter 1, verses one, chapter 1, verses 1, 2, 9, and 11. And I'll help us out with the, the frame this lesson, okay? Revelation 1. Um, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servant, things which much must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Verse 2. Who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus. Christ, for all things that we saw. Verse 9. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patna, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of the trumpet. Verse 11 saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, and what you see, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea, that's verse 11. Amen. So even when John prophesied, he did the same thing. His prophecies were to those churches in that day, but it's also that those churches represent churches that are will come in the future, 
right? His prophecy was about what he saw, and he, he, he was in the presence of God, and, and God told him to write these things, just like Isaiah. These things that he, that he saw, and these things that he told us, there are not just things that were for that immediate moment, there are things for a moment then, a moment in the future, and a moment in the end times. So Isaiah has the same tone, and that's my goal in, in this cell. Okay? May I make a point here? Just because somebody didn't mix up on that word, the revelator, you mean revelator. Revelator. <laughs> just I apologize. Just because tripped out on that word. Man. I, I apologize for my, 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 my poor writing, but it is a, the revelator. He's a, he, because he revealed, he was a revelator. He revealed the things to people. That was his... Now people might be turning around <laughs> like an ele Like an, the elevator, but he's a relevant... <laughs> Okay. Revelator. Revelator. Oh, that's future. All right. Oh, oh, oh. I didn't All right. You guys can hit me up for my point. It's the subject matter. All right. So as we as we proceed in chapter 25, 25th of Isaiah. It's also going to look towards, the book will look towards uh, Jesus. It will also look towards uh, the day of the Lord. It will also look for, towards the kingdom of God. That's, what, that's how this chapter is going to unveil to us, and that's how I'm going to unveil it to you. Okay. So, uh, so the, what I'm doing in this particular text, uh, uh, like in this is Isaiah 25, we start in the sixth verse. And, and, and I have to bring you to the first verse in order to get you an understanding of the rest of the, the text. So as we, we look at this first text, and then we're going to try to interpret a little bit, and then we'll go to each one. I'm going to also uh, do it in different translations because uh, we get into our quarterly, because it, it has a magnification uh, as it, you look at it from different translations. But this particular one in the King James Version, so I can read this for us, uh, uh, Isaiah... One through five, King James. Some read from the cell, please. Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee and will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. For thou hast made of a city an heap, of a defense city a ruin, a palace of strangers to be no city. It shall never be built. Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee. The city of the terrible nation shall fear thee, for thou hast been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shower from the heat, for the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. Thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers as the heat in a dry place, even the heat with the shadow of the cloud. The branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low. Amen. Amen. In, in this particular text, he's talking about Babylon. And Babylon was uh, uh, tormented the, 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 the people of Israel, uh, God's people. And, and here he's having a prophecy that Isaiah talks about the future, what's going to happen to this, this people. So, in 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar came the king of Babylon, and the Babylonian Empire had become the leading empire in the world. And Nebuchadnezzar focused on expanding his empire uh, uh, and expanding Babylon to become the greatest city in the world. He built a beautiful palace. He rebuilt and repaired the walls, and their big, wide, and fortified walls. He improved the city streets and embellished the temples. And, uh, and, and this prophecy that Isaiah had at this time was not fulfilled to 200 years later, okay? That's the significance of prophecies about the time and about the future. So finally, 200 years later, Isaiah wrote about Babylon. Uh, what he wrote about Babylon was part of the prophecy was fulfilled. Isaiah told, uh, I mean, God told Isaiah, Behold, I will stir up the Medes against thee. That's the media, media of Persian Empire. And uh, who regard silver uh, and as gold. And as for gold, and they will not delight in it. The Medes captured Babylon just like Isaiah predicted, and today Babylon is still an empty city. In times of peace, tourists can go and see the partially rebuilt uh, ruins of Babylon, 
they have remained empty almost 2,000 years. So God's prophecy that he gave Isaiah was fulfilled. Okay. So as we look in our quarterly, now we're into the quarterly. I've done my intro and we go look in this quarterly. We're going to look at this lesson from many different points of view. As you see this 200, like that, the, what I just said was that he foretold a, a, events that were going to happen 200 years uh, into the future. He has some that are going to happen 750 years in the future. And he has some that are going to happen 2700 plus into the future, which is where we are today. Okay. So, uh, this is the, uh, our quarterly. But I want to start it from the New Living. And if someone has to read the, the, these Bibles here, the, the Living, you can read it from that or you can read it from the board. Someone can read that for me, please. The Lord of Heaven's armies will spread a wonderful feast for all the people of the world. It will be a delicious banquet with clear, well-aged wine and choice meat. There he will remove the cloud of doom, the shadow of death that hangs over the earth. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. He will remove forever all insult and mockery against his land and people. The Lord has in that day, the people will proclaim, this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord in whom we trust. Let us rejoice in the salvation he brings for us. For the Lord's hand of blessing will rest on Jerusalem. But Moab will be crushed. It will be like straw trampled down and left to rock. So in, in our quarterly, uh, we only have these uh, few verses of scripture. Uh, and, and basically, it is a, a prophecy of, uh, of Isaiah that talks about a future event that's going to occur. And that, that word Moab, just to know Moab is the, the city or the, the, the people that are against God. That's Moab. That's, when you see it in the Bible, that's what it basically means. And, and, and that well-aged uh, wine and choice mean, we're talking about a future event. And that's what Isaiah foretells to us. Uh, what I wanted to do was to find a, a simple commentary to kind of explain what this passage meant. So I found this, and this is by some guy, Gene Tucker. I kind of spruced it up a little bit, but I think it's important uh, for us. It kind of gives us an understanding of what that passage basically meant from the point of Jesus and his resurrection. Like I said, the, the message that Isaiah has was from a 200-year point of view, from a 700 years after his period of time, and it actually speaks to the future. So someone to read the first part, read this and I'll stop you in the middle, okay? Hang on one second, right here. So, uh, so th this is the, the 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 coming of the Messiah, right? That Isaiah foretells about the Messiah was going to come, and he says that he's going to come, and he's going to he's going to come at this mountain. Of, he's going to come and and on this mountain is he's going to defeat an enemy. And there Jesus comes and he and he and he, and he defeats Satan because he becomes the Messiah. Satan tried to stop him all along the way, and he ultimately goes to the cross. And at this passage where meal salvation received through Jesus Christ at the cross and at his resurrection, and later he's sending the Holy Spirit to mankind to give us, who are the believers, power to defeat an enemy and the eternal life that we all receive by being God's believing people. So that, that is a, this is what that message is saying that we have, uh, that we have today. It, is, it speaks to the return of Christ. Again, 750 years, an event to occur in the future. So go ahead and finish. Go ahead. Yalgatha, isn't Yalgatha, isn't that the mountain, isn't that where Christ was crucified? That's right, he's speaking, he's speaking okay. to that period of time, about okay. a mountain. Okay. That's what you referenced. So the feast was going to be on Yalgatha or Mount Zion? Well, M Mount Zion is, Mount That's Zion is, one. Mount Zion is, is a word that has a number, number of meanings. It doesn't mean just the mountain, it also means the, uh, the territory. Right, and that's, that's, that's what it, so it's not just specifically the individual mountain, okay, Mount Zion. 
He said, it's a broad term. Okay. okay. When you said meal on Galgotha, that's like the, the the meal is that that we that that the the Passover feast Jesus becomes that Passover feast for us. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. He becomes okay. the Lamb of God, okay. and he and and becomes that, and that's what it said. I, I, Isaiah speaks in. Like I said, he's the uh, Shakespeare of the Bible. He speaks in his fluent in his, in his terms. So basically, what he's saying is that uh, future events are going to occur. And again, he's speaking, you know, 750 years before Christ even went to the cross. Okay. He's talking about the sacrifice. And right. The right. sacrifice. Yeah. Galgotha is sacrifice. Right. Yeah. Like sacrificial lamb. There you right. go. Okay. Yeah. Now that's all. Hey, I want to get it straight. I understand. <laughs> okay. All right, go what? read. <laughs> all right, read the rest, please. You know, the Messiah, the, the Messiah, everybody waited. The totality of scripture all the way up into the Old Testament was all talking about the Messiah who was going to come. And now the, these people, now the, the Jewish people, the chosen ones, but not only those. It says that, the, that those dirty-faced children, the broken people, those, 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 uh, those Gentile people all get grafted into the family of God because now our God has finally come. Our, the one we've been waiting for is finally coming. That's what Isaiah is saying in this text. Okay? So, uh, when you look at this, uh, at the book of Isaiah as well, it has a, in this chapter 25, it has a, another kind of a meaning that one can extrapolate from this text that we have. And if someone read just the red part, well, read, read until I tell you to stop. In Jerusalem, the Lord of heaven's army spread a wonderful Well, go ahead, go ahead for the next two, next two verses. There will, if there he will remove the cloud of gloom, the shadow of death that hangs over the earth, he will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. He will remove forever all insults and mockery against his land and people. The Lord has spoken. Amen. So again, so again, that's good. So again, Isaiah's prophecy that we have in 25, in verse 25, it has another meaning that can be extrapolated from this text. It talks about another future event that's going to happen far into the future. And that is the marriage supper of the Lamb. That there is a, a, a feast that's going to occur in the future that is set. That there is this table that's going to be set. And all the choice meats are going to be there. That is what he talks about. There's an end time component to our chapter. You know, we, we can look at it from all different points of view, but it, it, it speaks to future events. Okay? Uh, it also speaks to the kingdom of God. And that's why I said that he has these, these, these components to what he says. And then not just in, in, in this 25th chapter. It's all throughout the book of Isaiah that it, it speaks to future events that are going to happen, that speaks to the kingdom of God that's going to happen at the end times. So, you take the same text again, and let's read it from the King James Version, okay? I just want to read this again from the King James Version, but it's still the same text our quarter, okay? And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all Okay, when you hold that, wine's on the lead. So basically what that is, is when you have the grapes that have been sitting on the vines for a long, long period of time, they get better. And they get better. And that's what it talks about, that, that in this feast that we're going to have, in this end time, that it's going to be the best of the best. Go ahead. Uh, it's wine's on the lead, Yeah, I'll wait. Okay, he will follow up death and victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall be taken away from all all the earth. For the Lord has spoken it, and it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. 
that his will, we have waited for him, we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. For in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord rest, and Moab shall be drawn down under him, even as straw is drawn down for the dumb hill. Amen. So if you look at it from this King James Version, one of the words that you see is, is kind of magnified again about this mountain, right? And our text is the mountain of God. And, and, that, and that's why I, I, I gave it to you in this term, because this term focuses on another part of this prophecy, but it, it's, it's how you interpret it, and one can interpret about, again, future events are going to happen. So, after the judgment, uh, this ju uh, judgment period is, co is concluded, uh, the, uh, uh, a fire will engulf the whole planet, melting all the elements in the works of Earth's history. And in uh, 2 Peter 3, uh, 10 through 13, after the fire, well known as the Lake of Fire, in Revelation 19, 20, 20, 20, 10, 14. Uh, uh, he has finished burning a pure and transform, uh, transformed the new earth will, will be in place, which will never grow old and corrupt. And that's talking about this new Jerusalem. And it is the new earth on which the new sea of Jerusalem will descend. Okay? So I, Isaiah's prophecy is also talking about a future event, the new Jerusalem, is going to occur. Okay? Do you have a question? What? There is more than one Well, it, it talks about, in, in, it, in that terms, that is a, a destruction of everything. And then the new Jerusalem will come and supplant the earth that we have at this point. Right, but where is the label fire reference? As, as, as that, right. I, I, I think that the terminology in this particular point is about the, the everything being destroyed in, in a fiery mass, and, and that's how it kind of is depicted. Not necessarily, I guess, it's metaphorically spoken of. So this is a general description of right. the name of the The name of the Exactly. Okay, so if someone can read for me this New Jerusalem that Isaiah is speaking of that's going to happen, this, this mountain of God. If someone can read this for me, Revelation 21, 1 through 10. Uh, in your Bible, please. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. A new heaven and a new earth, right? Okay. So the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. So I saw the holy city of New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, out of heaven from God, fair and bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. If who, to him who is thirsty, I will give a drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who will come and will inherit all of this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the coward, the unbelief, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb, the tenth earth. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain, great and high, and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Amen. Do you notice that the prophecy of, that Isaiah had now some 2,700 plus years is, is, is that it, it parallels the, the prophecy of John that, that, that a future event is going to occur. And that is the, the New Jerusalem coming down. It's going to be Mount Armageddon, right? Mm -hmm. All right. That, is that when the fire takes place? When the earth is renewed? There is a after the thousand year reign has, has been, yeah. after it all, then the New Jerusalem comes down. Okay, but does the fire take place on the earth? So uh, it, it happens after at, at the judgment. The judgment, the earth is judged as well. Oh, at the judgment, okay. 
Right. The final judgment. Everything's judged. And then there is a new Jerusalem that comes down. Okay. Where, where, where. So at the end, so when the battle of Armageddon, that's when the judgment is going to right. take place. That's when okay. you look at it. It, okay. it is in Revelation 21. It's at the end, is the ending of the, the revelation that John gave to, to his people. Okay. And I think as we learn it, what, what Ron teaches more revelation, we'll get a, a even better understanding. But there's, when the new Jerusalem comes down, it's after the judgment of the earth, okay. after the judgment of people. And then now God sets up a, a new okay. a new Jerusalem where now, because of the people who are, the people who died, and for the thousand years, all the people were still judged. Because some people who come out of the tribulation, they had never faced death. They were not like uh, those who will proceed, those who are raptured up. You are not like those who receive new bodies. They are still have flesh. And they still have to be judged because through that thousand years, no one's dying. And then what happened? There's actually a purge of everybody. And there's a purge of the earth. And then there's a new Jerusalem that comes. Well, some are dying. The ones that take Satan go with Satan, they're going to die. They're going to die, for sure. <laughs> That's why I said it's after okay. this judgment. Okay? okay. Quick. Yeah. Uh, I say that uh, Adam and Eve are coming out of God's view. They moved into a corrupt world. Yes. Okay. So from that time until the day, the world has become corrupt. No matter where you live, no matter where yes. you are. They had it easy in a perfect world, so they moved from perfect world to a corrupt world. And that corrupt world exists today. Yes. Okay. So God's expectation that it's going to continue and continue and continue to be a corrupt world. Yes. And allow the devil to do what he wants to, invest the best they can do, evil things, all that kind of stuff. So he gets tired of it. So in Revelation, God says, I'm tired of this. So I'm going to make me a new world. Is that, is that where we're going with this? I, I think that you have to look at it that there was a plan. And the plan started, at, 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 as I said before, at Genesis at 3 and 15, when he says that he was going to send a redeemer who was going to save the world from Satan. Because this is Satan's realm. Satan got cast down. Him and one third of the, the, the heavenly hosts got cast down. And this is where they live. And when the, when the earth was destroyed at the flood because of, it says that the man's thoughts were continually evil. And then God restarted and reset the button with Noah. And then that six people began to start a whole world again all over. But evil was still present because even the Tower of Babel, they still were, were even after he re reset the button, there was Tower of Babel, they were still evil. And even that Sodom and Gomorrah, they're still evil because we live in a realm that's, that's, that's controlled by Satan. And ultimately, there's only one way out, and that is through Jesus. And that's where the Redeemer had to come. And the Redeemer came, and all you have to do is put your trust in Him. And at the end time, you make it out of the world a lot. Good job! Good job! So all this time, the devil has been very, very busy. Oh, yeah. And oh, he's yeah. busy every day. That's right. So it's, 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 so I'll read so I'll read again in your quarterly verses nine and ten and we close out this lesson. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. Let us be glad in him. Let us rejoice in his salvation. For in this mountain shall the hand of the Lord Amen. Oh, our, our goal is that we are waiting for that day, and, and our hope is in Jesus, and our hope is continuous in Jesus, because that's the only way that we have any hope at all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt.